to the right. I'm, and I'm equal wise from in the diagonal grade. Okay, so the raid is basically about uh, a SWAT team that are raiding a building that is owned by a drug baron and the idea is that the, dr the building hasn't been touched by cops for like 10 years and because of that the, the boss has rented out rooms on every floor to like criminals and, and gangs and uh, as the SWAT team go up the floors suddenly they get spotted so the whole building gets locked down and the lights go out and now they have to sort of fight their way through like, every room and every floor in order to survive. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. So basically, he is saying that uh, he plays a character called Rama, mm -hmm. and Rama is like uh, new to the force. He's still a rookie. He hasn't got much experience in terms of the, the type of mission that they're going into. And uh, throughout the process of that that mission and that assignment, he has a sort of like a, a sort of like a complexity because of the the thoughts about his pregnant wife waiting for him back home. Then, yeah. My wife's Indonesian Japanese. And um, yeah, so she she kind of uh, we were we lived together in Wales for uh, for a couple of months, and she hadn't really settled, and you know I wasn't really doing much in terms of the industry myself. I hadn't pushed myself enough to get noticed, and she found me uh, work as a director on a documentary out in Indonesia. And that documentary was about Pencak Silat, and that was the first time I'd had like experience of uh, that martial art. Mm -hmm. I had always been a fan of Kung Fu films and Muay Thai films since I was a kid, but this was the first time I got to actually see Silat. And throughout that documentary then I kind of got a feeling of what it'd be like to live and work in Indonesia. While I was working on the documentary, uh, I did travel, I traveled to a lot of different places to learn about like Silat and film different people that learn that's learn Silat in West Sumatra and Java and then also in Jakarta and when we went to Jakarta we went to the house of his master because his master was one of the people we were filming yeah. and that's when we ended up meeting them because we were filming the, we were our focus on the documentary was about the master but um, I started to film like the group practicing as well as research thing mm -hmm. and that was when I first saw Eco then and it was one of those things where it was it was apparent very early on even back then that he had this, like the way he performed Silat, there was a certain amount of screen presence about it mm -hmm. and something like, a, and a style to it that just, you know, it it worked on camera. And so I was like, my wife was my production manager on the documentary, so I just kept elbowing her and saying, like, we got to get in touch with him, we got to use him for something. So that's kind of how it all started then. Pertama kali juga untuk beradaptasi di depan kamera. Okay. Yeah, he said that was the first time he'd ever even done anything in terms of like film or performance, mm -hmm. and so it was like it was a learning curve for him because it was the first time to figure out how to adapt uh, into kind of uh, work in front of the camera. Then, yeah. what kind of work goes into the choreography for a movie like this? Uh, for the first the first three months of every project, we this is before pre-production even. It's just me, Iko, and Yayan. Yayan's the guy who played Mad Dog in the film. Yeah. And the three of us will just get together in a room, and I'll have a handy cam, and then I'll give them like uh, a rundown of every scene, in the f every fight scene in the film. Mm -hmm. So they'll know the props, the opponents, the location, the skill set of the fighters as well. Like, are they really good or are they disposable? Uh, what what the weapons are being used and what's the tone of the fight as well, how aggressive is it. And then um, once they have all of that background detail and, and those little bullet points along the way like, oh, you lose your weapon here, you, uh, you, you, you pick up the guy here, that kind of thing, they then fill in the gaps. So then they are kind of, they kind of like come together and with the, the design, like the individual movements like the elbows and the kicks and the blocks and the punches. And they'll present all of those to me and then we'll work together to figure out the structure for it so that we have these like moments where the fight scene rises and then drops and rises and drops and it keeps like a, a dynamic movement to the fight scene. Then we take like a flat wide shot of that entire fight then mm -hmm. and we have that as our reference point. Um, we go back, we shoot again using a handicap but this time we shoot the entire thing shot for shot and we do it, we actually make a, exactly as it would be in the final film. So we know every edit decision, we know every angle, we know every camera movement. And then once we sort of have that in place, then we use that as a template. So at the end of three months, we've got those video storyboards for every fight scene in the film. When it comes to production, we use that as our, as our template. So we sat there in production, the laptop is there with the scene loaded in, and then every time we shoot that shot, we drop it in and replace it on the timeline. So we can see then if it works, because we're watching, you know, the guys in the office fight, 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 and then that one shot where it's the real location, and then does it cut smooth, yeah. you know, in and out, and then we gradually we end up replacing them all. 
So each shot is kind of like a, it becomes like a jigsaw piece. So it has to be perfect on the in and out point. But the benefit of this is that we treat it, it's like a safety net for us because we can uh, take that process then and, and if we, we know that it's wrong while we're still on location. Mm -hmm. So then we're just like, okay, we need this shot, we gotta fix it. So we're still on, still on location, still on set. It doesn't cost us an extra day, it doesn't cost us extra yeah. th anything extra except for one more shot or something. So then it's kind of, it saves us money then, it's more economical for us. Like before, before I went to Indonesia, I hadn't really, I hadn't made anything with martial arts at all. I had never even tried to shoot like an action thing before. Um, I'd watched martial arts films all my life, like throughout my childhood, and I was obsessed with them. And uh, it, it, I kind of drifted away from them in the mid '90s. So I think like Fist of Legend was probably like the, the, that last sort of like key film in the mid '90s that I that I fell in love with that I thought was amazing. Mm -hmm. And then I kind of drifted away until On Back came back out. And when On Back came out, it was like oh shit, it was like a, like a like a revolution again for martial arts films, for those old school martial arts films. And I think like my my approach really has been. I think my, my taste is more geared up towards those 80s and early 90s martial arts films. Yeah. So the way I shoot, the way I edit, it's not not flashy. Like I guess in a way my approach is kind of like, I'm not technical enough to be flashy as an editor. See? So for when I'm doing it, I keep it kind of straightforward and I prefer more of the sort of classical style of cutting and, you know, and, and, and presenting the action. But in terms of like Eco's performance, yeah, he's really, really starting to raise his game now from the first film. Because in the first film, it was it was all of our, uh, all of our, all of us on the crew and on the cast. It was our first time to do a film like that. Mm -hmm. We'd never touched martial arts before as a film, and so we were learning as we were going along. And you know, we made like you know, we made mistakes along the way, and there were some things we did which were really good. Um, but I feel like his his performance has developed so much from that first film now. Um, the way he handles like you know. Like the fight sequences, especially as well. Now, it's so much more complex and so much more uh, detail in the choreography as well. Oh, okay, okay. Just okay. yes, like untuk uh, like jadi preparasi sama tapi preparasi sama cuma untuk mentalnya mentalnya lebih yeah. susah ni untuk drama. Okay, okay. So basically, what he's saying is like when he prepares like for the action scenes, like him and Yaya and the other choreographer, they they prepare ready for it. They have to kind of like do lots of stretching exercises and you know uh, warm up sessions before we start fighting mm -hmm. to get then to kind of get that. Uh, that adrenaline go in to get them ready for that kind of fight and to kind of focus on each movement and everything they have to do in the fight sequences. And then he was saying then for the for the drama, he almost has to kind of build his adrenaline up even more um, and relies on like Yayan and also myself to kind of get himself prepared for it. Yeah. And that he finds he finds the drama much more difficult than doing any of the fighting. Because for the drama it requires like a different process, a different sort of you know, mindscape for it. Yeah. And so he, he actually gets more nervous doing drama than he does for the fighting because <laughs> the fighting is kind of second nature to him now but the the drama is still like looking for that feeling yeah. feeling and the character yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, after Miranda we'd um we we wanted to do a different project first there was a much bigger more ambitious scale film um but the climate for finance for film in Indonesia was pretty bad at the time and it kind of still is now really and um what happened was so we um we we looked for money for about a year and a half couldn't get that film up off the ground and after a year and a half, like I was just sick of being in the office, and you know, and I felt like we needed a second film to to keep Eco's name known. Yeah. And so the raid was basically a backup project. It was like a plan B. I started looking at you know watching a lot of films for research purposes, so like Die Hard and mm -hmm. Assault Precinct 13. And then one of the the key ones was actually a music video, uh, Roman Gavras music video, uh, MIA Born Free, mm -hmm. and it's such a great music video. I loved it so much and. Um, that kind of gave us a visual style then, and that kind of gave us this sort of like this leaping off point where uh, like we'd show that video to everyone on the crew like when it was pre-production we were like we were recruiting people in we were like you watch this music video this is this is the tone that we want to go for with it so yeah you're already talking about the follow-up which I think is Thug so uh, yeah like uh, the, the Indonesian title is called Baranda we don't know yet for the English title for okay. the sequel yet um, but yeah, uh, Momentum Pictures have also picked it up as well in the UK, so we're looking forward to seeing what they're going to do as well. And uh, we don't know what the English title for the sequel is going to be yet, but it's uh, it's the it's the the project is the script for that one that we couldn't get the finance in place for, mm -hmm. that that led to us doing the raid. So that we were developing the raid, and I looked at that old project and I was thinking, what can I do to link these two together? 
and so I decided to kind of make this one work as a direct follow-up as a sequel to it yeah. so we changed the lead character to be the continuation of his character mm -hmm. and so, so now that's where the sequel is going but we're gonna start pre pro in that this September and then start shooting in January then with the view to kind of get it ready for sometime middle to end of next year then. My immediate future is to do the sequel to The Raid and after that I want to prepare to have something ready that I do outside of Indonesia then. And the idea is that like um, I'll do one film in Indonesia, one film outside and go back and do a film in Indonesia as well. I got like five or six projects that I want to do with him in Indonesia again, like you know, more more ideas of finding different ways that he can beat people up. So uh, fingers crossed we can kind of uh, find a balance between the two. Thank you. Thank you so much.